so this is the second part of the, um, um, about causal misperceptions and their behavioral implications. So let's remind ourselves what uh, we saw on Friday. So um, the idea there was uh, that decision makers are modeled uh, as agents who have subjective causal models using the Bayesian network language. Um, the causal models are uh, formalized as a DAG, directed acyclic graph, where nodes represent variables and arrows represent perceived uh, direct uh, causal effects. And uh, the, the, the belief formation model was very simple. There is a true objective distribution. That's the steady state distribution. The agent fits his own subjective causal model to the data by factorizing the true distribution according to his graph. That spits out a subjective belief. And then he uses the subjective belief just as in the standard uh, model. In particular, you can calculate conditional probabilities. For example, my subjective probability from my action to some consequence. And of course, the mistake there is that he treats that uh, conditional probability as if he's calculating a causal effect, uh, which he shouldn't be, and that's the mistake. That's the element of bounded rationality there. Um, we saw that in this case, uh, even when you're trying to define subjective maximization with respect to such a belief, it's not necessarily well defined because of equilibrium effects. It could be that your own long run uh, frequencies over actions affect that subjective probability, and that suggests that we need to define individual maximization as an equilibrium object. And so I use the term personal equilibrium to describe such an equilibrium. We saw that uh, with this DAG language, we can, we can express a bunch of um, errors of ca causal attribution, uh, types of mistakes like coarse reasoning, reverse causality, omission of uh, confounding uh, variables, etc. Uh, illusion of control, so various biases that can be described as errors of causal attribution, and we can check using graphical tools from the Bayesian network literature whether those types of causal attribution errors lead to potentially equilibrium effects. And we saw a bunch of examples where uh, in both cases I looked at demand for something that has no intrinsic value. Okay, what I want to do today is to start talking about interaction, interaction with and uh, among agents who form beliefs in this way. So there are two types of things I've been working on. Uh, one is you have a rational principle interacting with uh, uh, an agent who has wrong causal model. And the question is whether this rational principle can somehow systematically fool uh, an agent because of his causal misperceptions and not because he enjoys fooling him uh, per se, but because it serves his uh, payoffs. For example, a central bank trying to get um, uh, real effects from monetary policy. That's an example we're going to look at today. The other thing that I'm actually not going to talk about today is a strategic interaction between players where the notion of a player's type also includes his subjective causal model. So it's, I won't uh, have time to talk about that today, so I'll devote my entire attention to the first question. Um, so here's the setting that, uh, that, that we're going to be uh, immersed in today. So there's going to be a leader and a follower. The leader is going to be the leader, the principal. He's going to observe a state of nature and take an action. Then a follower, that's going to be the agent who has his causal misperceptions, he's going to observe some signal. The signal can be correlated with the uh, leader's action. Uh, could be just the action, just observing the action. Could be correlated with both the action and the, the, and the state. And then forms the beliefs about any other number of variables in his causal model. So, and one of the things that is going to make it a little bit interesting is that at least in one of the examples, he's going to draw, uh, he's going to form beliefs about variables that are not just exogenous variables, but also endogenous variables. And actually some of these endogenous variables could actually depend on his beliefs. So for example, in the macro story, I see some central bank announcement and I form a belief about macro variables, but some of these macro variables may well depend on my own beliefs, just like in Inku's uh, model yesterday. Now, in the applications, in the examples that I'm going to look at, it's going to turn out that because of the story, the story induces an indirect utility function for the leader. The, the leader's utility function is going to be uh, a linear function of the follower's belief. So it's just going to be induced by a natural story about the fundamentals of the interaction that the leader's payoff ends up being linear in the beliefs of the, of the uh, follower. And that means that the, what, the, what the leader ends up caring about is whether he can uh, 
create systematic belief errors, whether, whether the subjective beliefs of the follower are going to be systematically biased. That's the only thing that the leader will care about. Uh, the leader will be rational today. Uh, he will have a correct uh, model of the environment, and the follower will, be, will have a subjective DAG, which will be wrong. And I'm going to analyze the situation with an ex-ante perspective. So I'm going to be choosing a strategy for the leader. I'm going to choose a belief, could be multiple beliefs. I'm going to choose the belief for the follower, such that the belief is supposed to be consistent. The belief of the follower is going to be consistent in the sense that it comes out of his causal model. Um, and I'm choosing those to despair to maximize the, the leader's uh, payoffs. Now, this, this, just, just, this, this need to, potential need to select beliefs results from this endogeneity. That it could be that my belief induces endogenous variables, but also my belief distorts the distribution of the endogenous variables. So there could be, remember that in the personal equilibrium model that we saw on Friday, there could, in principle, be multiple equilibria. So even in individual decision problems, you could need to select between uh, uh, equilibria. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, it's not going to play an important role. But just the, the framework that I have in mind is that the we choose a strategy for the leader, a belief for the follower. The belief has to be consistent in the sense that it comes out of the causal model of the follower. And the attempt is to maximize the, uh, the leader's payoff. Yeah. So, so the leader knows the, the DAG. The causal yes. Of the, yeah. Easy to extend to cases where he has uncertainty about that. But. Okay, so let's start with an example to, to put things in context. Uh, rating systems were a common theme, so here's a, uh, here's a story in this spirit. So suppose that there is a firm that produces some product. The product has exogenous quality theta. The firm observes the quality of its product, and then it decides whether to sponsor a review, to pay for a review. Uh, let's denote by S the decision whether to sponsor the review. S equals one means that you sponsor a review. Then the, the content of the review will be some function, some stochastic function of the true pro, uh, quality, quality of the product and the sponsorship. Okay, so if I pay somebody to write a review, maybe he's going to feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable writing a nasty thing about my review, so it will be nicer. Maybe it's going to be the other way around. He, want, he wants to prove his independence. Who knows? But there's going to be some stochastic function. The content of the review will be some stochastic function of theta and s. Our consumer, so the leader is going to be the firm and the follower is going to be the consumer. The consumer only observes T. He only gets to see the uh, content of the review. And what he's interested in is the quality of the product, so he forms a quality estimate E. E will be the subjective, uh, uh, subjective expected quality uh, of the product. Now, once again, in keeping with this steady state approach, imagine that we're in some steady state in uh, this environment where there's been a long run joint distribution over theta, s, and t. In principle, we should also include e, but it's not going to be important for this, uh, for this story. So there's a joint distribution over these three variables. And now m another generation of a consumer uh, enters the scene and observe a realization of t. Now, the firm's payoff is going to be completely standard. Uh, the firm uh, cares about the subjective quality assessment of the consumer. Why? Because, for example, E is the willingness to pay of the consumer, so that's the price that I could charge. Okay? So that would be my price, the subjective quality assessment. So my payoff is E minus the cost of sponsorship. Now, if we were in a world with rational expectations, um, then E <clears throat> would be the expectation of theta conditional on the content of the review that I see. That would be the rational expectations um, quality assessment. That means that if we're just interested in the ex-ante optimal strategy for the firm, not talking about time consistency issues or equilibrium, just the ex-ante optimality for the firm, then the firm wouldn't want to invest in, in sponsorship. So if the firm could commit to a strategy, it would want to commit to never invest in sponsorship. And the reason is that the only thing that the sponsorship could possibly do is to manipulate the consumer's belief about the quality of the product. But ex-ante, because of rational expectations, uh, the uh, the quality assessment is going to be unbiased. On average, E is going to be equal to the expectation of theta. So that's just the, the principle of rational expectations. I can't systematically fool the agent by some uh, sponsorship strategy. 
so I'd rather not do it. So, so it's a standard kind of career concerns, reputation uh, setting where the commitment strategy is not to try to tamper with uh, consumers' beliefs because you can never do that on average. Okay, so this, this gives us a very clear benchmark. No sponsorship, at least as far as commitment is concerned, if the firm could commit, no sponsorship uh, with rational expectations. But then the question is, what happens if the consumer doesn't understand the situation? Of course, you can model lack of understanding in various ways. We had uh, uh, a lecture about certain types of uh, uh, naivete in, in inferring from, from, uh, from your views uh, a couple of days ago. Um, so, of course, you could model that in various ways, but my approach is to think about a subjective causal model. So a, a rough qualitative understanding of how the variables in this world relate to each other. And here's, here's one story. For example, a naive causal model. What's a naive causal model? It's just a name. But the idea is that the consumer thinks that sponsorship is like tipping. So the product is, uh, the product, um, uh, the quality is realized. The critic comes along, writes a review, and then maybe he's going to be sponsored or not, ex post facto. So he thinks that S is actually a reaction to T. It doesn't affect T, it's caused by T. So that's a basic kind of qualitative causal belief about the relation between theta, S, and T. I call it naive because you think that the world is nice, critics come along, they, they, they write something only as a function of the quality of the product, and then um, there are some. Now, the sponsorship, you don't need, necessarily need to have a belief about the, the, the direction of the relation between T and S, because it's like you don't know who sponsored the review. Right? So maybe the firm sponsored the review, maybe a rival uh, uh, sponsored the review. Right? If somebody writes a nasty review of my, uh, about my competitor, maybe I actually want to, to express my gratitude and pay him something. So who knows? The sign, the sign, not the direction, exactly. You believe, that the, you believe in the sign, but you're willing to let the data tell you uh, about the direction. I'm sorry, the, you, you're right, the sign, not the direction. Thank you. Uh, the cynical model goes the other way around. You, you really think that uh, um, content review, the content of the review is purely a function of sponsorship. It has nothing to do with the actual quality of the product. It's only a function of whether you're being paid or not. That's kind of cynical. Uh, and that's something I call the cynical model. So suppose that the consumer comes along, for example, with a cynical view, and he interprets the entire distribution through the prism of his cynical worldview. So re reminding ourselves how this works uh, from last Friday. So he takes the, the true distribution, P, and he factorizes it according to his DAG, which would mean basically estimating the relation between S and theta, estimating the relation between T and S. Those are the correlations that he pays attention to because that's what his causal model tells him to do. And then he pastes these things together. And then when you look at the conditional probability, which is what he's interested in, the probability of theta conditional on T, this is what you get. And again, given the cynical worldview, it's quite uh, reasonable. I see T, the content of the review. I'm saying, okay, let's try to figure out what's the probability that this thing has been sponsored. Okay, and I know the core, and sort of I have, my model estimates this correlation between T and S, so I can calculate the probability of sponsorship zero or one conditional on T, and then for every possible sponsorship status, I once again know the correlation between that and theta, so uh, I figure out what the distribution over theta is as a function of S. So this is by subjective belief. And so my quality estimate, having seen T, is this thing here. That's just the expectation of theta conditional on the T that I've observed um, according to my subjective belief. And my subjective belief was a result of estimating my wrong cynical model. What does the firm care about ex ante? Again, we're looking at the ex ante point of view of the firm. From the ex ante point of view, the only thing that the firm cares about oops, is this thing here. What is, the ex what is the quality assessment on average? What's the quality assessment on average in the long run? And this is the quality assessment in the long run, right? So we just ask for every possible content uh, of the review, that's the quality assessment. And we're just taking averages according to the long run frequencies of various realizations of T. So that's the expectation of E. And the key question is, is the expectation of E that is the average quality assessment, is the average quality assessment 
coinciding with the average quality of the product. Because if it is coinciding, if the two coincide, that means that ex ante, there's nothing that the firm can do. When I say equal, the question is whether it's equal regardless of the strategy that the firm can play. Because maybe it's going to be equal for some strategy of the firm. Maybe it's going to be different for, for another strategy of the firm. But if this, this equality holds, no matter what the strategy of the firm is, then that will extend the rational expectations benchmark to this world. You do the algebra, and uh, the answer turns out to be yes. Now, the algebra is kind of, it's not that tedious because it's only three variables, but it's kind of makes you kind of want to say, oh my god, if this is what I need to go through if I want to work with this model, then I don't want to work with this model because it's a bunch of algebra. Actually, the algebra is tedious, but it's not mindless because it involves successively applying two operations. One of them is, look at this blue thing and this blue thing. This is just using the, using the basic definition of conditional probabilities. So it's just changing the order uh, of S and T. And then because we change the order of S and T, we can change the, um, the, the, the order of integration, and then we can marginalize. So we do this thing repeatedly. We, we use marginalization and the definition of conditional probabilities, and then in the end we get there. But the hope, of course, is that we won't need to do algebra, that there's going to be some graphical thing that we're going to look at, and that's going to help us figure out whether um, the, the, the agent's uh, quality assessment is biased on average. So what we see here is that although the consumer is wrong about the world, he's just cynical about the world, the world is not that cynical. Sure, sponsorship could affect the content of the review, but the content of the review is also a function of the actual quality of the product. So he's just too cynical. And he's making a wrong assumption. His causal model assumes that T is independent of theta once we condition on S. So it's, again, it's cynical. It's not true. Nevertheless, his average quality assessment is correct. And that means that the ex-ante optimal strategy for the firm is robust in the sense that it coincides with the rational expectations prediction. It goes back to a question that Michi asked uh, um, at the end of uh, Inku's talk. Can we say something about, you know, about the following? Although the agents have a wrong model, in the end, as far as we're concerned, as far as some aspect of the analysis is concerned, it's as if they had rational expectations. So that's the kind of question I want to analyze, and I'm going to show you that I can use the tools, the graphical tools, to give some kind of partial answer to that question. So that's going to be the question. Which causal models, and now I'm phrasing it differently, which causal models make systematically biased estimates possible? We saw that the cynical model in this example uh, protects the agent from, causal, uh, from systematically biased mistakes. Uh, in the sense that his average quality assessment is going to be okay. Again, he's going to get things wrong, but the average quality assessment is okay, and as far as the firm's op uh, ex-ante optimal strategy is concerned, that's the only thing we care about. So there's going to be one question, which is, which DAGs make systematically biased estimates possible? And then the second question is, well, suppose that we have a DAG where we see that it doesn't pass the test. I'm sorry, it passes the test in the sense that it, it makes systematically biased uh, estimates potential, potentially uh, possible. But then it depends on the parameterization of P. But will standard parameterizations of P eliminate that, eliminate that possibility? For example, in macro applications, it's very conventional to use uh, linear normal models. So that's a parameterization. It's just conventional in economic models. Will that parameterization restrict the, the ability of principles to systematically fool agents with wrong causal models. Okay, so that's the, the question. So I want to forget for the next few slides for the general analysis, I want to forget about the, I want you to forget about the leader follower context. Forget about the leader. Let's just look at the follower. Let's just look at the agent and try to understand how he forms beliefs given some distribution Forgetting for a second that that distribution is a result of a strategy that the, that the leader has played. So focusing on the agent, trying to understand the question of whether his subjective beliefs will be systematically biased in that sense. So the setting will be general. There's going to be a collection of real-valued economic variables. X0 is simply the variable that the agent uh, gets to observe. So he's, he, the agent is going to have some subjective causal model represented by a DAG, the set of nodes of the DAG, um, 
is some subset of n, capital N. Capital N is the set of the names or indices or labels of the variables. So you may omit some of the variables, but not the variable that you observe. So if I observe a variable, it's in my model. So I get to see x0, and I form an estimate ei of some other variable i. Okay? For example, I see a central bank announcement, form a forecast of inflation. Once again, the idea is that we're in some kind of steady state. Our agent comes along after a long history that is described by P, an object objective joint distribution over everything. Here I'm being a little bit pedantic and defining this everything to include also the forecasts of, of agents. It's not important. It will be important for, for making things intelligible in the macro example that I'm going to show later on. But I think right now for the general analysis, it's going to be a bit confusing, so forget about that. I, I, put, that, I put it up over there because it's actually needed for us to, to embed the macro application in what I'm doing right now. But for the general analysis, it's not important. So there is a joint distribution P over the economic variables. It has full support over the economic variables. And, um, okay. and then the agent fits his subjective causal model to this P. You, by the way, you could ask, in line with this uh, second bullet, the causal model is defined over only the economic variables. It's not defined over the expectations. In principle, your causal model could include expectations. Okay? In the paper, I discussed that and explained why it's without loss of generality under a very, very weak assumption. Let's put that aside. So your causal model doesn't include expectations, it only includes some of the, the economic variables. Okay? There's a joint distribution over the economic variables. You factorize this distribution according to your causal model, and that induces a subjective belief. Your estimate of variable i is the subjective expectation of xi conditional on the x0 that you observe. Remember, so I have this joint distribution over all the variables resulting from factorizing the true P according to my DAG. Now I observe X0 and I compute the conditional probability, conditional subjective probability. And then I can calculate the expectation of Xi according to this subjective probability. Okay, so this is clear. So that's just the definition of EI. Here's the key definition. We're going to say that the agent's estimates are unbiased if, on average, on average, this EI coincides with the objective expected probability of XI. So this expectation is with respect to P. Okay, so that's the actual expected value of, P, of XI, according to the true distribution. This is my subjective assessment, conditional on the signal that I've received. And we're just averaging over all the signals. And that means that on average, in the long run, on average, my uh, estimate of xi is correct. Again, I'm making mistakes. This could be wrong. But those mistakes even out in the long run. And note that, notice the quantifier here. It's for every variable that I estimate. For some applications, we don't care about every variable. We care about just one variable. But the characterization I'm going to show you today is just for this quantifier. And in the paper, there's, uh, there's also a characterization for a specific i which is a bit more complicated. And the technical question then becomes, and it's completely independent of the interactive aspect. Again, it's just about the single agent problem, creating those conditional beliefs, and asking the question, which DAGs induced unbiased estimates? Okay. So I want to characterize those DAGs. Question about that. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not clear. Um, Okay, so let me remind you to, 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 to state the result. Let me just remind you uh, a couple of concepts from Friday. So two DAGs are equivalent if they encode the same distortion mapping. Remember that a DAG can be viewed as a distortion mapping, a mapping from objective distributions to subjective beliefs. You have two DAGs, you can have two DAGs that are, look different, but they actually encode the same mapping, and that's the simplest example. Okay, Th these two DAGs are equivalent. Uh, and Verma and Pearl had this uh, important characterization of this equivalence relation, which I'm reminding you. Two DAGs are equivalent if and only if two conditions hold. First, if you ignore the, arrow, the direction of the arrows, the two graphs look the same. So putting directionality aside, they're, they're, they're the same. 
The second condition is does include, uh, do, does make uh, use of the direction of links. We're just looking at the set of immoralities in the DAG. I mean, immorality is this configuration. Having three nodes, i, j, and k, i and j send links into k, but they're not directly related. They're not directly linked. That's an immorality. You look at all the immoralities, all those triples in the, in the DAG. If the two DAGs have the same set of immoralities and they have the same skeleton, the same undirected version, then they're equivalent. Okay. Then the uh, follow-up uh, uh, concept was the notion of a perfect DAG. A perfect DAG is a DAG that has no immoralities. So for example, this DAG is perfect. This DAG is not perfect because here you can see an immorality. We have two unmarried parents. A single parent is moral, right? But uh, um, uh, having two unmarried parents is not. Okay? So, uh, so this is perfect. This is not perfect. Okay? Corollary going uh, uh, is a direct uh, corollary of the um, of the Verma Pearl characterization result. Two perfect DAGs are equivalent if and only if they have the same undirected version. So, in perfect DAGs, directionality is actually not important. So, in, you could say that the viewing perfect DAGs as causal models. Where's the causality? The direction doesn't matter. You could take, give me a DAG. I can, give me a node in the DAG. I can find an equivalent DAG where that node is ancestral. So that means that the causality aspect of a perfect DAG is really um, uh, muted. So it's, it's not really very important. Whereas directionality is, is to some aspects of directionality are maintained throughout the equivalence class in an imperfect DAG. Some directions really are robust within the stable across the, uh, the, the, the cell of the, of the partition if you have an imperfect DAG, but not if you have a perfect DAG. So perfect DAGs are causal models, but there's something about their causality is a bit iffy. And here's the result. The agent's estimates are unbiased if and only if his DAG is perfect. So that means that we've identified the source of uh, potential uh, systematic belief biases. Every DAG that is not complete, that is not uh, fully connected, neglects some correlations. But the question is, what kind of correlations are you neglecting? An imperfect DAG neglects correlation between two perceived causes. Okay, here's a variable, here's a variable. I think that those two variables cause a third variable, but I don't establish a direct causal link between them. That's the kind of correlation neglect that creates problems. But any other type of correlation neglect protects the agent from, uh, doesn't create problems as far as the agents about, about this question of systematically biased expectations is concerned. So, so in some sense, you can rewrite a little bit uh, uh, with, a, with some kind of rhetorical flourish. You can, you can rewrite this proposition in light of the previous uh, slide and say, a causal model creates problems only when it's really causal. Right, because a perfect DAG is not really causal in some sense that we've discussed in the previous slide. So every time your causal model really is making some causal assumptions, uh, then there is a potential for fooling you. Yeah. Uh, it does implicitly in the sense it doesn't. It doesn't. It does. Look at the quantifiers. Here it says for every p. For every p, so, so it's not with respect to a true DAG. You know, it, it, a different definition could be fix some R star, which is some true DAG, and define the agent's estimate to be unbiased relative to R star if for every p that is consistent with R star, so that would be an analogous definition that defines this property relative to a true DAG. Here, this is more demanding. It says for every p. Uh, I don't think... I don't think that I have a characterization which is relative to, to some R star. That's an open problem, how to, how to do that. So it's like, you're not, I'm not willing to make any assumptions about the true process. I'm asking, regardless of what the true process is, um, w w will your beliefs be uh, correct on average? Okay, so that's the, that's the result. And again, the, if, if I was only interested in, in beliefs about a, a specific variable, not about all variables, then there would be a more elaborate condition uh, that relaxes perfection. The graph wouldn't have to be perfect, uh, but there would be some restriction on the, on, on the, on the immoralities. And, and 
it actually relies on the tool of deseparation that I mentioned last time. But I, don't, I won't have time to present that today. The if part is absolutely trivial once you have those tools. And remember that when we, when I showed you the example, the, the reputation example, at some point I had to go through some algebra, which would be horrendous if we had a big graph. Now, thanks to very basic characterizations, the, the very basic characterization, the, the Verma-Pearl theorem, um, the proof becomes very, very simple. So let's see. Let's look at the if part, meaning suppose that the graph is perfect, let's see why the, the beliefs are, un, the expectation, the estimates are unbiased. Now, remember, uh, okay, one result that you need to prove, uh, it's trivial to prove. Um, well, part of it, one part is trivial, the other part is not trivial, okay? so. But that's a result I'm not going to prove here, but it's something you can prove uh, in general. Ask the question of whether your marginal over a certain variable is uh, correct or not. Let's just look at the marginal belief over some variable. Result, a lemma. If the node, if the node J is ancestral in your graph, then you don't distort the marginal. Not distorting marginals is not a general property of this model. It's not a general property of this model. It, you know, some solution concepts in, um, uh, in this literature that, uh, that I'm drawing on, like uh, cursed equilibrium, analogy-based expectations equilibrium, they demand uh, undistorted marginals sometimes as, as one of the criteria for equilibrium. My model doesn't do that. So sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But if you have a causal model, and J is an ancestral node in your causal model, you don't distort the marginal over that uh, variable. And it's an if and only if. If, you're, if your node is not ancestral, this should have been ancestral in, uh, oh, this is if, I'm sorry, so forget about the only if. So if, you're, if, J is, if J is ancestral in your model, then you don't distort the, the marginal. Your subjective belief doesn't distort the marginal over J. Now because R is perfect, Remember the, the couple of slides ago. Every J can be regarded as, as uh, ancestral. It's going to be ancestral in one, in some equivalence, uh, equivalent DAG. That means that all your marginals are undistorted. That's a property of perfect DAGs. Imperfect DAGs don't satisfy that property. For imperfect DAGs, some marginals might be distorted. So that means that all your marginals are correct. Now, once you know that all the marginals are correct, uh, checking the unbiasedness becomes uh, mechanical. Uh, what, what's written here is the average conditional belief over xi. The average conditional belief over xi. So this is the belief over xi conditional having seen x0. And we're just taking the average of that. Now, we can, we can make two exchanges between the subjective and objective marginals. For example, we can replace this thing with a subjective marginal over x0. And it's gonna be the same because the marginals are not distorted. But now what we have here is just the subjective marginal over xi. And once again, the subjective marginal over xi is coinciding with the objective marginal over xi. So this blue thing is equal to that blue thing, and this extends to expectations as well. So it's a very obvious result. So it comes straight out of the perfection, and the property of perfection is that every node can be viewed as ancestral, and you never distort the marginals over ancestral nodes. Okay, so very basic properties. You don't need to do any algebra. Okay. Uh, the only if I'll skip the only, well, I won't skip the only if. So um, the only if I'll just give you the basic idea, the imperfect DAG must contain an immorality. Now the immorality, the, the, the thing about the proof that makes it not so trivial is that you don't know where zero is. Zero doesn't have to be one of the, belong to that immorality. Um, zero is the variable that you observe. But for example, suppose that you observe zero, that's just like, uh, it could be, for example, the content, uh, the, the review content. So I observe the review content, and suppose that my subjective DAG has these two perceived causes of the review uh, content, but I don't think of them as being related. So, so there is a correlation neglect. So I neglect the correlation between the causes of zero, the thing that I observe. So we can easily construct a distribution, a joint distribution over xi and xk, such that the, those two variables will be correlated, but I'm neglecting that correlation 
So it's like I'm double counting signals. So it's, it's like xi and xk are signals that are informative of zero, but I'm counting them as, uh, double counting them because I'm ignoring the correlation, and that distorts my, my marginal. So you can easily construct a distribution that will have correlation between the, the parents in the immorality. Um, your subjective belief ignores that correlation, and that leads to systematically biased uh, belief over x0. I'm sorry, over xi, over one of the i's, i or k. So that's the basic idea of the proof. It's a bit more complicated because, again, you don't know where zero is. That's just the like basic idea of the proof. Now, l let's go back to the reputation example and see what we can learn from that. So both the naive DAG and the cynical DAG, they're both perfect, right? They have no immoralities. So we don't need to do any algebra. We don't need to worry about the parameterization. We just know that in either of these cases, the firm cannot enhance its average reputation. So the, the, the ex-ante optimal strategy for the firm is just going to coincide with rational expectations prediction. On the other hand, look at this DAG. I call it the cursed DAG because it's a kind of error that you will see in cursed equilibrium in Ice Arabian. So here, the, 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 your, your causal model is that the content of the review, you do realize that the content of the review is a function of both the true quality of the product and the sponsorship. So you're not cynical, you're not naive. However, you don't realize that sponsorship is a function of theta. You just think that there are some kind of sponsorship patterns out there, but you don't realize that they're responsive to the actual quality of the firm, of the product. Okay? So you neglect that, neglect that correlation. Now this DAG is imperfect. It's the only imperfect uh, three-node DAG. So, so that DAG is imperfect, and so our diagnostic tests kind of says, oh, you have to be careful, maybe the firm can now manipulate its average reputation. So it, once again, just like the C rationality thing that we saw on Friday, it's like a diagnostic non-parametric test. You look at the graph, you look at a purely structural property of the graph, and you, you do some simple test. If it passes the test, for example, the DAG is perfect, you say, oh, no matter how I parameterize the problem, the firm will never be able to do better than the rational expectations uh, uh, benchmark. On the other hand, if the graph is imperfect, well, then we need to worry about the parameterization because maybe for some parameterizations it will be like this, maybe for others it will be like that. So here's an example of a very simple parameterization of the problem that will show you that in this case the firm can enhance its reputation. So suppose that theta takes two values, zero, one, low quality, high quality, both equally likely. And suppose that what sponsorship does is that it creates a deterministic bias in the review. So if your product is bad and it's not sponsored, you're going to get a terrible review. If it's bad but you get sponsorship, uh, but, but the review is sponsored, then it's going to be a moderate review. Uh, if your product is good and it's going to be sponsored, you're going to get an excellent review, a rave review. Okay? So sponsorship creates a, an upward bias of one. So it's a deterministic conditional probability. Now let's see what, what it does for the, uh, I'm going to do it very briefly, it's not something I'm going to give you calculations for because it's not very interesting, but the way it's going to work is the following. When I observe t equals zero or t equals two, then I'm not going to make any mistake because zero can only, when I see the review zero, a terrible review, then objectively it can only happen when the product is bad. There's no actual fluctuations in theta conditional on t equals zero. This guy, the only mistakes that, are, that he's making, this is important to understand about this model, is that he doesn't know how to interpret variation very well. He accounts for variation in a wrong way. But if something doesn't fluctuate, then he gets it right. So conditional on t zero, theta has to be zero. Conditional on t two, theta has to be one. Okay? So I never get these things wrong. Although I have a wrong model, because this thing doesn't fluctuate conditional on what I observe, I get it right. So the consumer is not going to make any mistakes when he sees the extreme reviews. However, you can play a strategy, the firm can play a mixed strategy, and it will have to be mixed, such that um, he will actually misinterpret the, um, he will misinterpret the, uh, the, the moderate review, the one, such that it will overestimate the probability that this is a good product. 
And that's the thing that is going to create an overall expected exaggeration of the quality of the product. So on average, because he's not getting the, when, when he sees extreme reviews, he's getting them right, he's, getting, he's, he's imposing a correct interpretation on that, but he, when he's seeing a moderate review, he exaggerates the probability that this is a good product. On average, he exaggerates the probability of a good product, that the product is good. So his average, the average reputation exceeds one half. Uh, you can calculate and see that actually the model constrains you quite a bit about how much you can fool this agent. It can't exceed 9 over 16. So by, by the way, one of the messages that you'll see of this thing is that it's not that easy to fool these guys. They have wrong causal models, but they do fit them to the data. And the mere fact of fitting a model to data uh, creates um, a lot of discipline, and it, it actually makes it quite hard to, to fool these people. So here you can fool him, but by quite a, not so much. Okay? And by the way, if you're interested in the optimal strategy, as long as the, as the cost of sponsorship is not too big, the optimal strategy is simple. Um, if you have a good product, you don't want to sponsor. You don't want to sponsor a good product. And you want to sponsor a bad product, but with probability that never exceeds one half. And once again, the reason is that you don't want to create too much. You want, you want these things to vary. You, you need some variation in those things. So, it's not like if you, if you just sponsor, uh, if you sponsor S all the time when you have a bad product, then you're creating this kind of uh, perfect correlation between theta and S. It's as if there was just one variable, which is, uh, which is S and, uh, or theta. And what you want is to have, what you want is to have two variables that co-vary somehow, but in a non-trivial way, and the consumer doesn't understand how they co-vary. But if, the, if the, the way they co-vary is very, very simple, then the misperception doesn't work. Okay. Yes? The exante, yeah, well, okay, so remember the E, the E, yes, the E, entered linearly in the payoff function. The motivation for that was very simple because that's the price that you can charge. So the, absolutely. So the way this paper came about was inductive. <clears throat> I just looked at the bunch, I, I started working with my model, started applying it to a bunch of uh, environments. In many of those environments, whether because it makes sense descriptively or because it's just a simplification, there's a lot of linearity. The linearity is very conventional. There's nothing unusual about the linearity. And, and once you have that linearity, those kind of things uh, become relevant. Of course, yeah. I mean, also, if, you, if I didn't look at the commitment problem, then how your beliefs change, how your beliefs are distorted conditional on T also matters, not just with, what, what's the average. Absolutely. So for example, if you think about the, um, the dieter's dilemma, and the dieter's dilemma, if I was trying to sell you, if I wanted to sell, remember the dieter's dilemma was there is this magic potion, um, and, uh, and you think that it might be related to your health. I'm selling you this thing. I want you to think that it affects your health. Uh, you might have correct uh, beliefs about your health. You're, you're, it's not going, the fact that you buy this potion is not going to affect your overall beliefs about your health. Not, it, on average, it's not going to make you think that you're going to be healthier than, uh, than you really are uh, because you have a perfect dad. So it's not going to cause you to exaggerate your beliefs about health, but you're still going to buy it, and you shouldn't. And that's the thing that the firm cares about. So absolutely, in some contexts, what you care about are the conditional mistakes, not whether those mistakes even out in the long run. However, in this particular application, the only thing that matters for the extent uh, optimization is whether the mistakes even out on average. Okay. No possibility, well, the, well the, the good thing about the young uh, uh, research program is that, right, everything is possible. So, 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 so far, I haven't done that, but I think it's an obvious question. So the, the question of model revision, of course, it, I think, of course, it will have to be dealt with at some point. I think it could be very nice. Obviously, nothing, I've done nothing on that so far. <laughs> 
And I think the question is, it's always a question of, it's, it's related to what Inku said yesterday. There has to be some model in the background. This is where the bound of rationality is, is going to be, have, will have to be modeled. Why do we use models? Why do we use simple models? Here, I'm waving my hands and saying, well, there is a value for a simple model because otherwise, blah, blah, blah. But what, what is this otherwise? In reality, is it because of computational complexity? Is it because you want to identify things econometrically? Is it because you want to explain your model to something, somebody else, and if you can't explain a complicated model? There is an element of bound rationality, and if it's not modeled, then, yeah, you have a simple model, you test the model, it, it, for example, suppose that it fails the test, what do you do? So Inku presented the model yesterday with some, some formal uh, process and uh, where you do revise your models. I, in, this, in this concept, because it's static, it's not a dynamic model, I think there will have to be some model that, that asks why are they using simple models? And so when will they be willing to say, okay, let's complicate our model, let's add a tweak? Actually, I'll remind me that when I go to the macro. Okay, so, so at some point I'll get back to that. Okay, monetary policy. The scare quotes are as, as important as the monetary policy. So, <laughs> but it's, it's a very standard uh, setup. It's a very standard setup uh, from the literature. Uh, it goes back to Barrow Gordon and Kidlin Prescott. And uh, I took it from Sargent 99, and then Inku worked on these things as well. Um, so it's a very standard setup. You have a central bank choosing an, action, choosing an action A that affects inflation pi. In this example, the central bank doesn't observe anything. So in a slightly more complicated example that you can find in the paper, the central bank does observe some state variable before taking this action. But today, it's just spontaneously taking an action A. That action stochastically affects inflation pi. The private sector will observe A, observe A. So unlike some of the, unlike Kidlin Prescott and Barrel Gordon, I observe the action of the central bank. And then I form an inflation forecast E. But of course, I haven't seen pi, the, the actual inflation, when I do that. So, it's, so the formation of the inflation forecast is simultaneous with the realization of pi. Real output is given by a linear Phillips curve, uh, an expectation or a new classical Phillips curve. So it's just unanticipated inflation, right? So outputs or real output changes, doesn't really matter. So, so the output change is or real output, the way I call it here, is just the inflationary surprise. If inflation is higher than the expected inflation, you get a boost to real activity. If it's below, you get uh, depressed uh, real activity. And I add some uh, error term. Um, I need the error term to get full support because, again, the, 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 these things without full support, you start conditioning on, on zero probability events. Uh, at some point, I'll take this to zero. And the normality, I don't really need the normality. I only need the symmetry of this uh, distribution. So I might as well just assume normality. So it's an ex expectation of Phillips curve. So set up, I borrowed it from Sargent. Sargent and Inku afterwards, uh, they worked with, the, with an idea in which the private sector has rational expectations, but the central bank has a wrong model. Um, but here, the central bank will have a correct model, the private sector will have a wrong, I'm sorry, the central bank will have a correct model, the private sector will have a wrong model. Now, if the private sector had rational expectations, it would form the optimal conditional inflation forecast, just knowing the true process, which I haven't spelled out, but there is a true process for inflation as a function of A, and that will be the inflation forecast. Now, because on average, Right, so sometimes you, you see A and you try to predict pi. There's a stochastic mapping. Sometimes you'll overestimate uh, inflation. Sometimes you'll underestimate. However, on average, you're going to be fine. Certainly, if we ag aggregate over all the A's, so on average, E is going to be equal to pi on average. So on average, there are no uh, systematic errors, uh, inflation forecast errors. And so the central bank cannot use monetary policy to enhance expected output. Once again, notice that in this, this, in this story, the central bank moves first, the private sector moves second after seeing A. So this whole Kidlin Prescott story about the time consistency, it wouldn't be an issue here with rational expectations anyway. So I wouldn't have to think about ex ante optimization. I could just do uh, no commitment because if I take A, and then you choose your belief after seeing A, it's like a commit to A. However, this distinction between ex-ante optimization and, and 
and, and time consistent behavior is going to be important here even though the, central, the private sector moves after the private sector. And the reason is that you'll see, just like in the reputation example, the central bank will, might want to randomize. So I'm thinking about this randomization as ex ante. Okay? So I keep sticking to this ex ante approach. Even though we're in a context in which normally it wouldn't be an issue because the private sector gets to observe what the central bank does, here it will matter. So remember, I'm still with the ex ante approach. So, but in any case, the private sector doesn't get, if the private sector has rational expectations, uh, his long run inflationary forecast coincides with long run inflation. So the central bank cannot use monetary policy to enhance expected output. That's the basic. Uh, um, Kidlin Prescott uh, uh, insight, uh, or going, going back to Friedman and Phelps in the late 60s, uh, that if you believe this, uh, if you believe this uh, Phillips curve, if you believe this Phillips curve, then monetary policy cannot be used to enhance expected output. So it's like new, ev effective neutrality of money. But now suppose that the private sector's DAG is this thing here. It's a causal model. What is the interpretation of this causal model? Well, actually, in this context, it has a nice interpretation, which is a classical belief in monetary neutrality. Not new classical. New classical neutrality is just the argument that I've just given you, that the new classical argument, again, going back to Phelps and Friedman, is that, in principle, monetary policy can affect output, real output, but only via surprises, only to the extent that you can surprise the private sector about inflation. This guy thinks that it's just there is no causal path from A to Y. So you just think that A categorically cannot affect Y. Y comes from something else. It's a real sector thing that may have its own causes that I leave out of the model, but it has nothing to do with monetary policy. Inflation responds both to, both to the real variables and monetary policy. But the key thing here about monetary neutrality is that we can define monetary neutrality, classical monetary neutrality, as a causal model that has no causal path from A to Y. And here you can see it's an example where there is no causal path from A to Y. So I think that A and Y are independent. You can see that it's an imperfect DAG. So once again, our diagnostic test uh, uh, lights up and says, ooh, ooh then it could be a problem here. They're, they're, they're having an imperfect DAG. Maybe they can be fooled. If they had a perfect DAG, they wouldn't be fooled. Okay. So this is the subjective uh, belief of the private sector. They factorize, it's like they estimate, they send their RA to estimate this model. This is like a structural model. The RA estimates this model, he estimates the margin over A, the margin over Y, and he regresses pi with respect to A and Y, and he pastes these things together, and that's the subjective estimated model. And then the inflation, inflation forecast just uses this estimated model to calculate a, a conditional expectation. I've seen A. This is my model. This is the idea. That's, there's a steady state distribution, a historical distribution P. I fit my model to that historical distribution and get a distorted view, which is this one. Now I've seen a new realization of A. And I, esti and I update my beliefs according to this estimated model. And you can write it down like this. Because you can see that I view Y as an independent variable that is independent of A, so I average over all the possible realizations of Y. If I had rational expectations, I would be conditioning on A, because I would be realizing that Y depends on A, because in reality it does. Y does depend on A, because we don't have absolute monetary neutrality. So Y does depend on A, but uh, the private sector believes in monetary neutrality, so they don't account for that. And that failure to account for the correlation between A and Y is going to create problems for the private sector. Now, the objective distribution is actually consistent with this DAG, right? Because the central bank moves first, A, and then pi and E are realized simultaneously. And then Y is given by the Phillips curve, so it's only a function of E and pi. That's the, that's the true DAG. That's the subjective DAG. So you can see in terms of DAG language, what's the belief mistake that the private sector is making? Well, he's making two mistakes. First, he's omitting a variable. He's omitting E, which is a bit like what Inku did uh, yesterday. That was the first model, uh, not M1, the, the one before, where you, you just don't realize that there is a, an expectational causal uh, path. 
but the other thing that you do here is that you flip the direction of causality between pi and y. So it's a combination of omitting a variable and flipping uh, causality. Okay. Now expected output, because of the Phillips curve, is the average long-run expected output. It's the average difference between the inflation and the forecasted inflation. So that's the actual average inflation condition on A. That's the forecasted inflation condition on A. What we're interested in is this thing here. And going back to Ariel's question, when I started working on this paper, that was the example that I worked with. So I got to this expression. I took the linearity from the model because the standard model is linear, just because it's simple, not because it means anything. But it is linear. So I came up with this expression. And so I realized that the, the key economic question here hinges on whether, on average, expected uh, inflation deviates or could be made below actual inflation. So the question here becomes, is there a strategy for the central bank, which is this thing here, that's the mixed strategy for the central bank, that will induce systematic underestimation of inflation, such that expected output will be positive. Now, why is this not trivial? Well, in principle, you might say, well, let's just, for every A, let's just calculate this difference between these two things. So then we just take averages. That should be simple. But actually, the complicated thing here is that this thing here is actually going to be sensitive to the marginal over A. Remember that kind of interdependency that we had, that, that calculating conditional probabilities is not subjective conditional probabilities is not invariant to the marginal over A. This thing, by definition, is invariant to the marginal over A. But this thing is not because our DAG violates that C rationality property. So because it violates that C rationality property, changing this marginal will change this thing. So that makes the problem non-trivial, technically. Uh, and we know that the DAG is imperfect, so we know that we should be on the lookout. Now, now it's just going to depend on parameterizations. So here is a very, very simple parameterization. It's going to be the simplest parameterization I could come up with that will create an effect. Parameterization is very simple. Uh, both A and pi are binary, 0, 1. So uh, pi 0 is low inflation. Pi 1 is high inflation. A0 means that you're trying not to inflate. A1 means that you're trying to inflate. And there is an asymmetry between these two actions. Uh, A0 is a safe action. If you're trying not to inflate, you have low inflation for sure. A1 is a risky action. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay? So, right? Because if A0, the probability of high inflation is 0. But if A is 1, the probability of high inflation is only beta. And, and this asymmetry is something that I need. Let's use alpha to denote the marginal over uh, this, the, the, the strategy, basically the strategy of the central bank. What's the probability that they try to inflate? It's the long run distribution. Again, think about this as a commitment ex ante uh, thing. And here's the result. Take the, remember the, the, the Phillips, uh, Phillips curve had this uh, noise term. Take that noise to zero. I introduced it anyway just to get to, to avoid the, uh, to avoid the, uh, uh, zero probability events, take that noise to zero, and the maximal expected output that the central bank can achieve converges to beta over four, and that's attained by the uniform distribution. So the, the central bank will mix uniformly between the two actions, and that will be the best thing that the, the central bank can do. And it will actually be able to do something. It will be able to generate systematic mistakes, uh, and therefore systematically high uh, expected output. Okay, so that's the result. And let's try to prove this. So let's first note that, remember that the action A0 is a safe action. It produces a zero inflation for sure. So that's like the extreme reviews in the, in the, in the, in the uh, reputation example. Uh, pi doesn't really fluctuate when A0. So there's nothing to be wrong about. No matter what Y is, uh, pi is still going to be zero. That means that although you have a wrong model and you have this distorted uh, formula for uh, the inflation, inflation forecast, for the realization A equals zero, you're not making a mistake, you're just getting zero. It just comes out mechanically, but the intuition is having seen A equals zero, pi really doesn't fluctuate, so it's, just, it's like having a misspecified regression. If the dependent variable doesn't vary, then your mistake doesn't really matter. Okay? So the mistakes will not 
occur when a is equal to zero. The only mistake will happen when a is equal to one. When a is equal to one, pi does, fl pi does fluctuate. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's zero. What the agent does, what the private sector does, is that it tries to explain this fluctuation in terms of fluctuations in y, treating y as exogenous. And that's the mistake. The mistake is that he's trying to account for the variation in pi as if they resulted from variations in y and as if those variations were exogenous. But they're not exogenous. They're a function of a. And the fact that you fail to realize that they're a function of a, that's going to lead to mistakes. So let's just uh, use this shorthand notation. E of 1 is the forecast, inflation forecast having seen A equals 1. So I now saw that the central bank tries to inflate. I'm trying to create an inflation forecast. One lemma that I'm not going to show here, but you can easily show, is that this E of 1 is some, because it's going to be some weighted average, pi fluctuates between 0 and 1. So it shouldn't be surprising that the actual inflation is beta, by the way. When A, when a is equal to 1, expected inflation is beta. And beta is strictly between 0 and 1. So if you had rational expectations, E of 1 would be beta. You don't have rational expectations, but nevertheless, your inflation forecast is not going to touch the extremes. It's going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. It's not going to converge to 0 or 1 when uh, this, uh, this noise disappears. So E of 1 is going to be bounded away from 0 and 1. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Now let's look at the ex-ante distribution over y. Why the ex-ante distribution? Because the private sector is trying to explain the fluctuations in pi in terms of fluctuations in y as if those fluctuations were exogenous. We need to look at the exogenous, the ex-ante distribution, the unconditional distribution over y. Now what does it look like? Remember the Phillips curve? What is the Phillips curve? The Phillips curve is the inflationary surprise plus some noise. The, the inflation can only get two values, 0 and 1. When a is equal to 0, when a is equal to 0, I correctly anticipate that inflation will be 0. So when a is equal to 0, both e and pi are 0. So y is just a normal distribution centered around 0. On the other hand, when a is equal to 1, remember, we're looking at the ex-ante distribution over y, not the conditional. So I'm looking at, at what happens to y also when a is equal to 0. So when a is equal to 0, those two things are 0, and so y is normal around 0. When a is equal to 1, well, here, maybe the inflation will be high, maybe it will be low. This happens with probability beta. This happens with probability 1 minus beta. So with some probability, pi will be high, and you'll have a positive inflationary surprise, because you expected the inflation to be somewhere between 0 and 1 on average, and pi, and pi ended up being 1, so you have a positive surprise. Y is going to be normal around that positive surprise. And if pi ended up being 0, you have a negative surprise. So Y is going to be normal around that negative surprise. So actually, Y, the extended distribution of Y is normal with a random mean which takes three values. Okay. You can see that, so, I'm, so my belief over inflation is that I'm going over all the possible realizations of y, this kind of three layer normal distribution. And for each one of them, I'm calculating the probability of pi equals one conditional on y and the a that I've observed. And what happens is that in the limit, when the noise distribution shrinks, those bells become concentrated around the mean. So in the limit, y just gets uh, three values, minus e1, 0, and 1 minus e1. So in the limit, py has a support of, three, of size 3, only these three values. And the only thing we need to calculate is these things, the probability of pi equals 1, Conditional on a equals 1 and each of those three values of y. Now, when y is equal to 1 minus e1, that's the positive surprise. So it must have been the high inflation. When, pi, when y is equal to minus e1, that's the negative surprise. must have been low inflation. 
The one thing which is a bit tricky here, and where I've made repeated mistakes, and I only found it, find out about this uh, only in the, the last round of this paper. Um, when y is equal to zero, this thing is a zero probability event. In the in the in the case of the vanishing of the vanishing noise. It's never, never a zero probability event when you have noise. But in the limit, when the noise is zero, this shouldn't be happening. When A is equal to one, Y should only be positive surprise or negative surprise. It should never be zero. So we have a problem here because in the limit, it's not really clear what this should be. So we need to guess. Now, and this is the only case where I'm invoking that kind of belief selection argument that I used before. Um, that let's guess a belief Let's guess a belief and then verify it. And, and this guess is a guess that helps the central bank. Because the central bank is happy when you underestimate inflation. So let's guess that the private sector, when he calculates this probability, he thinks that it's zero. So he thinks that condition on A equals one and Y equals zero, inflation has to be zero. That's good for the central bank because the central bank doesn't want you to think that there's gonna be high inflation. So I'm guessing and verifying that this is actually gonna be consistent. So now, given that guess, we now know what E1 is. E1 is just the probability that Y is high. In other words, it's the probability that the central bank tries to inflate and manages to inflate, and therefore generate a positive inflationary surprise. That's equal to alpha times beta, but that is actually the ex-ante expectation of pi. So n notice what happened here. It's as if the private sector didn't observe A. So what happens here is that when the private sector observes A equals zero, they correctly update their beliefs downward. They think there's gonna be no inflation. But when they see A equals one, it's as if they don't update at all. It's as if they didn't see anything. They still stay effectively with the ex-ante inflationary forecast. So what happens? When inflation is low, you correctly account for that. When, I'm sorry, when the central bank tries to not inflate, you correctly update downward. When the central bank tries to inflate, you don't update. Means that on average, you have a downward biased inflation forecast. Now we can calculate what the expectation of Y is. When the central bank doesn't inflate, there's no mistake. When the central bank tries to inflate, this is the correct probability of high inflation. And this is the subjective probability of high inflation. And here you get, exagger uh, you get a, a boost to output, and then you can solve it and get alpha zero. Okay. Now, we're not done because we need to verify that guess. We need to verify that given that strategy of the central bank, this guess was actually consistent, and it is. And the reason it is, is that in the limit it is. Because E1, is alpha beta, that's the probability of inflation condition, that's the actual, I'm sorry, that's the subjective probability of inflation after A equals one, that's less than one half. That means that minus E1 is closer to zero than one minus E1. In other words, the positive surprise is bigger than the negative surprise. So in the optimal strategy, the positive surprise is bigger than the negative surprise. And that means that when you start taking the normal noise to the, the, the normal noise to zero, that means that zero is more likely to be associated with a negative surprise, infinitely more likely to be associated with a negative surprise, which is closer than with the positive surprise. And that means in, that indeed in that limit, pi zero is actually more likely than pi one. So I made a guess. The guess was a good guess in the sense that if it's true, then it's the best thing that the central bank can hope for. Central bank operates under that guess, and then turns out that it's consistent. So this, there's, again, there's, there's this kind of equilibrium uh, aspect to it, which is a bit new, because the central bank plays a strategy. It creates some statistical patterns. The private sector estimates those statistical patterns. And the, 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 the misunderstanding of the statistical patterns depends on the strategy of the central bank, but then the central bank cares about that belief. And so we need to solve it as an equilibrium as if there was some, something simultaneous about that, although we're in an environment which looks like a Stackelberg thing. So it's a Stackelberg environment, but when we analyze the model, we analyze it actually as an equilibrium thing that is more reminiscent of um, a simultaneous move games. 
So there's something ironic about this example if you think about the macro story for a second because the private sector believes uh, in absolute classical neutrality whereas in reality there's only neutrality to the extent that new, new classical neutrality, that is neutrality only to the extent that you can surprise the private sector. Um, so you can't surprise the private sector and therefore the private sector's uh, belief in absolute neutrality doesn't work. Um, two methodological aspects that are interrelated, notice that the, pri the central bank tried to, um, uh, ran had to randomize. Randomization was part of the optimal strategy. It was ex ante randomization. Why? Because you want to create a statistical pattern that the private sector will misunderstand. But that means that you have a new source of dynamic inconsistency here. The old source of dynamic consistency is shut down by the assumption that the private sector observes A. So in the standard model, that would be a commitment regime. But here, you're ex ante committing to a randomization, and it's obviously dynamically inconsistent. Why? Because remember, when A is equal to zero, the private sector doesn't make any mistakes. When A is equal to one, then he's making a mistake. So if I toss a coin and it turns out zero, I would want to renege and, and retoss the coin you know, and, and to deviate to A equals one. So then there's a new source of dynamic inconsistency uh, in this model. Um, let me just uh, comment on what Vijay asked before. Suppose that um, this is my model, okay? And, and let's complicate it a little bit by saying that there is a state variable that the central bank conditions on. Maybe it conditions on. It doesn't have to. Okay? Completely, it could be a sunspot. And so it wouldn't really want to condition on that. Now, think about this belief revision story. So suppose that I'm a macroeconomist. I, I run this model, and this is a very strong, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from the 19th century in a time machine, and I really believe in classical neutrality, so I make this very, very strong assumption that A and Y are independent. And then um, Inku comes along and says, let's, let's do a specification test. And we run the specification test, and we see that A is actually correlated with Y. Okay? Now here's, here's an idea that I sort of I mentioned in the paper, but so far I think it's more like food for thought than an actual modeling, an idea for modeling. What would you do? If you, if, you, if you have a strong, it's a bit like the Lakatos philosophy of uh, uh, belief revision in science. This, what's your core belief? Your core belief is not that A and Y are independent. Your core belief is that there is no causal path from A to Y. So here's a tweak. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hmm, maybe A and Y are correlated. I'm just going to extend my model. I'm going to tweak my model and allow A and Y to be correlated only to the extent that they both depend on theta. So it's like I feel this is not a core belief. My core belief is that there is no causal path from A to Y, so I revise my model because somebody has shown me that A and Y are actually correlated, but I'm going to allow for that by tweaking the model without abandoning my core belief. So I think there's an element of tweaking. So you, somebody shows you that your model is wrong, you're going to change your model, but but not all changes are alike. There are some aspects of your model that you view as core assumptions, and others you view them as secondary assumptions, and you're happier to tamper with the secondary assumption. Is that the only way of tweaking the model? It's not the only way, of course. Do you have any idea? No, it's just a thought. I think it's more like motivation for further study. I don't have any concrete idea about it. But, I, but one thing that I think would be a nice assumption is that you have a causal model, but you can rank the, the it's basically a collection of assumptions, and you can say some assumptions, assumptions are prioritized. I'm not going to touch those, the others I'm willing to tweak and play with them. So I think that's an interesting idea, that although you have a causal model, you're more willing to tamper with some parts of that than with another. So just an idea for future work. Uh, a comment about parameterization. So, uh, like I said before, this is a parameterization, but it's very artificial. I cooked it just to show you that it can be done. Um, if I were a real uh, practitioner, then the, the kind of the default uh, assumption that I would make is that, um, say, the model is multivariate normal. That it's just a collection of multivariate, a collection of linear normal equations. Now, the moment you start restricting the, 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 the class of uh, P's that you're willing to look at, then, of course, the, the ability to systematically fool shrinks. Turns out that with multivariate normal distributions, it actually goes completely away. So um, any DAG, not just perfect DAG, any DAG will induce unbiased estimates whenever P is multivariate normal. 
Okay? And the reason is that there's something special about multivariate normal distributions. Normally, this DAG thing, it's like a Picasso painting. You, there is a picture outside, and then I apply some distortion that looks like a Picasso painting. Multivariate normals is like there is some picture outside, I apply a Picasso technique, and it would still look like a realistic picture. So there is a distribution out there, it has some structure, and the structure is multivariate normal. If I factorizing it according to a DAG, I still get a multivariate normal with undistorted means. So multivariate normals are, are distributions are special in the sense that the distortion is actually not distorting a lot of things, but it actually maintains the multivariate normality and, and doesn't change the, the, the means. Can, can yes, yes, but that's the thing. But if the only thing we care about are the long run averages, then we don't care about that. So this is where it's coming from. It's just the basic property uh, of multivariate normal. I think it's called. Yes. Uh, if there is an econometrician outside the model, can he detect that something is wrong with the uh, agent's belief formation process? Yes, absolutely. And actually, there is a version that I've played with, and um, so far I haven't circulated it, where, which goes back to Arya's question before, where the, the central bank cares, uh, the payoff function is not linear but quadratic, so they do care about correlations, and then, then the, the, the predictions will be different than the rational expectations. So definitely there will be differences. It's just that if the only thing you care about is boosting expected output on average, then with normal distributions, you can't. Just a comment about macro. Again, I don't know macro, but I, I like reading. Uh, uh, I always like reading. It's like gossip. Whenever people fight, I like reading about it. And uh, so I like to read uh, popular science and physics because they kept, keep fighting. I don't understand anything they're saying. but. I enjoy the fights, and the same thing with macro. So in the 1970s, and, the, and microeconomists don't really fight, which is a shame. They should fight more, but uh, macro guys like to fight a lot. So in the 1970s, that was a very uh, uh, turbulent period in macro, and there were very fierce debates. And actually, some of these debates were recorded. There are books of conversations and stuff like that. So you read the, those books, and you see that uh, there were battle lines. And, right, so the, and one of the key battle lines was rational expectations, and it was felt like this is like a fortress that you need to, so if you're, say, Lucas or Sargent, really feels when you read those things, it's like they're bringing the, all the rhetorical armies to protect that fortress of rational expectations. And, um, and the lesson from this exercise, they didn't have to. They, could, they could, didn't have to. It's just, just the mere fact that you have a model, again, this, this class of models, DAGs, and you fit them to data, even that gives you those impossibility results that Lucas and Sargent uh, uh, advocated in the, in the early 70s. So you don't need to assume rational expectations to get those impossibility results. The effective neutrality of money, you need a much, much weaker assumption. And that, that's, again, to me, it, was, it wasn't my motivation in working on these things. I was working on these things saying, oh, it's, it's going to be easy to fool people with wrong causal models. It's actually not that easy to fool people with wrong causal models as long as they get access to a huge pile of data and they can fit their models to huge piles of data. It's not that easy. It's not that e as easy as you might think a priori, and these are kind of examples of results that, that uh, flesh out this uh, main lesson. So, Ronnie, are there, I'm sorry, are there other common distributions? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I think that there was something about this, uh, the example that I had, there was some, some non-uniformity in the sense that uh, um, a, the, the two actions were, uh, were, were, a, the, were, their effect on pi was asymmetric. I, I guess there's some kind of, you need this kind of uh, non-uniform conditional probability. So if, I think it will be more general that if, uh, but I didn't prove it, that if pi, uh, if all that A does is to is impose a translation on the distribution of pi, so it just shifts the distribution over pi, then I think it will be the same. Uh, I don't think it was the, the normality here. Proposition is, is for normal because, because in the proposition, it's much more general in the sense that I don't require A to be, um, when, when in the end your causal model conditions on certain variables, um, you don't necessarily care about how they're distributed because you're conditioning on them. Um, so, so, so in some cases, I don't need to assume that everything is linear normal. 
for example, in some environments, the multivariate normality would also mean that players are playing a linear strategy, and you don't necessarily want to assume that. So in some applications, this theorem will be relevant only if you're restricting attention to equilibria with linear strategies. In other cases, if those variables appear in certain points in the graph, you don't really care about how they're distributed, and so your result will hold uh, even if not everything is multivariate normal. Um, so, so you can definitely strengthen this result. I just don't know exactly how in a general way. So let's summarize the leader follow model. Uh, so we looked at environments, applications, in which the leader's payoff is linear in the follower's belief, and when the follower's DAG is perfect, that means that the leader's extent optimum coincides with the rational expectations benchmark. Uh, we once again, just like last, uh, last time, we saw that we can use graph purely graphical properties, non-parametric properties, uh, for uh, diagnostic non-parametric tests. So you just look at the graph, look at how it looks like, you don't have to worry about parametrization, and you can run a test, and that test gives you the answer. And again, certain, if, if the answer is positive, then okay, you're done. If it's negative, then you need to worry about uh, parametrizations. Um, but then some parametrizations kill that anyway. So. Um, we saw that effectively the perfection uh, property is key, and in particular it means that the systematically biased estimates arise when the follower's DAG neglects correlation between causes. So just correlation neglect per se is not the problem. The problem is neglecting correlation between variables that you perceive as causes. Um, so you think that certain causes are independent, whereas in fact they're correlated. Um, we saw that... Um, what the leader tries to do is to create statistical patterns, possibly through randomization, that the follower misperceives. And that means that there could be dynamic inconsistency, and that's a new type of dynamic inconsistency. I think it's an interesting area for further research, because it's a new type of dynamic inconsistency. It would be interesting to understand when uh, the ex-ante optimal strategy is dynamically consistent, when it isn't, how pervasive that is. Um, so let me conclude those two lectures. Um, so. What I'm trying to sell here is a framework from equilibrium models uh, with non-rational expectations. So I'm going back to that motivation. On one hand, equilibrium approach, unlike uh, Inku's dynamic approach, equilibrium approach, but with non-rational expectations. And the non-rationality of expectations comes from the fact that you estimate or fit a wrong causal model. And it enables us to capture the role of subjective causal misperceptions. The DAGs represent causal models. Uh, and we can use them to capture systematic uh, errors of uh, uh, causal attribution. The Bayesian network tools, any textbook on Bayesian network will give you those basic tools. So far, I haven't used anything that uh, goes beyond the equivalence relation, the separation, and perfect DAGs. Uh, but maybe there's more material that can be used. Um, key recurring theme was that it's, it's, it's a very non it's a non-parametric approach. So um, you can get an understanding of your model even without get getting into parametrizations, which is incredibly useful sometimes. Of course, it depends. The results always have this kind of quantifiers where you know it's an if and only if. So the if is very informative. The only if means, oh, you have to keep thinking about that. Um, and so we were able to provide purely graphical characterizations of uh, behavioral effects like equilibrium effects, individual choice, or systematically biased estimates. I just want to, uh, it's not advertised really, it's more like showing you that you could do a bunch of stuff with this approach. So uh, the thing that I, at the beginning, I wanted to present today, but then I realized I won't have time, uh, games in which a player's DAG is an aspect of his type. So now I want to have not just a rational agent interacting with a boundary rational agent, but having interaction between boundary rational agents. This becomes more interesting when the DAG itself is, is fluctuating. So it's one of your types. It's an aspect of your type. I'm facing an opponent with a random type. I don't know what this DAG is. I don't necessarily, my DAG doesn't necessarily uh, take into account his DAG in the right way. Uh, I want to just tell you a few, just two papers. One is by uh, Heidi Tyson and Heiner Schumacher. Heidi, Heidi is a student at the LSE. Um, and she's been working on a principal agent model where you have a, um, a principal. It's just a standard uh, contracting moral hazard problem. But the new thing is that the agent has a wrong uh, a subjective mapping of uh, uh, from actions to consequences. It just doesn't understand the production process. In the standard model, we assume that I know the stochastic mapping from actions to uh, output or in costs. 
But you can think about this mapping as something could be quite complicated going through various causal channels, and I don't necessarily understand those channels. For example, my causal model might omit, might omit some of these channels. Uh, what is optimal contracting with somebody like, like, like that looks like? So that's an interesting exercise. Uh, something that I work on with Kfir Elias, um, uh, ca causal models, you know, it's very uh, evocative of uh, narratives. So when we think about, uh, for example, debates, uh, um, so very, something very topical, um, uh, debates in the U.S. about uh, unemployment in manufacturing, then you can think about those kind of public debates as, uh, as um, competing narratives. For example, the China narrative, that uh, it's all because of China, because of the import from China, uh, or the narrative, uh, the technology narrative, it's all because of technology. And so in the public debates, of course, we're not thinking about econometricians that, that, that show the, the results of regression. You get much more informal uh, uh, analysis of regularities that involves telling stories. And a causal model, a DAG, is like a story. It's like a story says, oh, because of import. So if we only changed our um, trade policy, that would affect import from China, and that would affect uh, employment in West Virginia, for example. So that would be one narrative, and then there could be another narrative, and it would be fighting over the public opinion. So in the paper with fear, we think about this as some kind of competition in narratives, and the behavioral assumption is that um, there's something hedonic uh, about uh, the public selection of narratives. They, Everybody just picks the narrative that uh, they find more palatable in some sense. Um, and so the question is, what are the winning narratives? And uh, what do they look like? And uh, what policies do they, uh, are they correlated with? So these are just two examples. Uh, to me, this is some kind of area of research that, um, that can lead to a lot of uh, interesting applications. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.